Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. And today we are entering a magical realm of fierce woodland beings and tier ranking the subclasses in the Humblewood Campaign Guide by Hit Point Press, which is now on D&D Beyond. Humblewood comes packed with everything you need to run 5th edition adventures with tiny little woodland creatures in their mythical world. But it also comes with four brand new subclasses. One for bards, two for clerics, and one for fighters. So today we're going to look at these subclasses and we are going to decide how they rank up against our ranking system that we've used for all of our other subclasses. There's a lot to discuss today, so let's get rolling. We love showcasing the work of other independent publishers creating 5th edition content because we're also independent creators creating content for 5th edition and we've got a book coming to Kickstarter ourselves. Monsters of Drakenheim is coming to Kickstarter very, very soon. March 26th, it launches, and you can get in on updates for that Kickstarter. This is going to be our third big project, our third big book, and it is going to be jam-packed with over 150 brand new monsters based on our terrible world of Drakenheim, which is full of eldritch horror, dark fantasy, faction intrigue, and all of that good stuff. But not only are we doing a bunch of new monsters, we're also going to pack this book full of lore for all of the monsters, including tactics on how to use them, and different skill challenges that players can roll to learn about the monsters. Not only that, but each chapter is going to come complete with its own layers so that you can inspire adventures based on the monsters in the book. You have the loot that you can craft from it and layers and lore to really bring to life adventure hooks, plots, and campaigns inspired by the monsters of Draconite. These are perfect for one-shot adventures that you might be placing into the city if you're playing a Dungeons of Draconite campaign, or if you're exploring the wider world, a lot of tools that you can use to inspire the adventures that characters might go on as they travel the world of Draconite. If you're not using our setting, you can still use all of this inspiration for your own homebrew settings as well. In addition, when you slay the fearsome monsters of eldritch horror and dark fantasy in the world of Drakenheim, you can harvest parts from their bodies and use them to craft magic items that you use against other monsters. What's really cool about the crafting rules that Kelly and I have created for Monsters of Drakenheim is that they're not based on downtime, gold pieces, or making skill checks. These are crafting rules that are inspired by some of our favorite games like Tears of the Kingdom and Valheim that really let you go out on adventures and make items to use on adventures. You don't have to spend 40 days off to make a pair of boots that you can use in the next dungeon. We've worked really hard on these rules and the monsters that you can face and fight in the world of Drakenheim. So check out the, the, the links down below to follow the Kickstarter page or join our VIP Discord for even more awesome previews. So venturing away from Drakenheim and back into the deep forest of Humblewood, up on screen right now, you're going to see the criteria that we use when we are ranking our subclasses for D&D 5e. In very, very brief, S tier is the best of the best. These subclasses are completely game defining and really stand and really stand a cut above in the way that they build upon the features of the ba base class and take it to the next level. A tier subclasses are really really strong and offer a really fantastic specialization for the class that takes it into a useful direction. If that's the playstyle that you want to go for, you're going to have a really powerful character. B tier stands for build in our books and that means that depending on the build that you create, the choices that you make, you could end up with something really strong with a B tier subclass. Although there are possibly some ways in which you could build this character to not work as well as some of the others at the table. A C tier subclass is one that might be useful in niche situations. In a very specific campaign setting or with very specific rule sets, it could shine, but otherwise it might not play as highly as the other options. And a D tier subclass is one that is a trap in our books. You should probably avoid taking it. You can get everything from the subclass by looking elsewhere and you can probably get it better. And of course, we consider all pillars of play in our rankings, combat, exploration, and social interaction. Although we will say that many of the subclasses that are here in the Humblewood book are surprisingly combat focused for a book about cute furry animals, but that, uh, that adorable owl adventure is still carrying a sword. 
So <laughs> it sometimes is hard for me to imagine the the cute critters smashing tables this on is, each other and punching each other in the face. But here it, we are. This is still like a red wall inspired setting. Right? Yeah. Um. So going into that, we kick things off with the Bardic subclass, which is the College of the Road. This is a subclass that is really gleaned, gleaned around the the idea of the Bard picking up new tricks as they explore the world and travel the back roads that connect the world of Humblewood. And so they're going to be able to eventually learn different abilities that are actually themed around other classes. We've This is a concept that we actually have seen in a few other subclasses for the Bard before. So it seems like this is a popular idea of like the Bard kind of having this ounce of multi-classing flavor built into their subclass. I think it really drives home the jack-of-all-trades concept that bards tend to have, is a bard is kind of your in-between person who picks up little bits from everybody they meet, including the other classes. Right away at first level, you gain bonus proficiencies. There's actually a pretty big list of different proficiencies you can take, and you get to choose a few of these. Yeah, there's a couple tools. You can choose a martial weapon if you want to, or you can pick up a skill or language. At third level, you gain Wanderer's Lore. Now when you hand out Bardic Inspiration, as long as the person is holding Bardic Inspiration, they can gain advantage on a Knowledge Skill Check of their choice. And they can apply the Bardic Inspiration die for that for a really big boost. Also at third level, you're going to gain your first Traveler's Tricks. You get to pick two of these, and there actually isn't a retraining mechanic for these within the subclass. So you got to pick them, and you got to commit to them. The Traveler's Tricks are really cool because you actually expend a Bardic Inspiration die to activate them. And while many of them are activated as a bonus action and then have a duration of a couple minutes or an hour, some of them are actually used in, in different ways. You learn additional tricks at 6th and 14th level, and the tricks also get better at 6th and 14th level as well. Also at 6th level, you get to choose a favorite trick. So out of the tricks that you have at your disposal, you pick one to be your favorite. Because these tricks are activated when you by using a Bardic Inspiration, the idea with your favorite trick is if you do not have any Bardic Inspiration when combat starts or when you roll initiative, you gain a single use of Bardic Inspiration, but it has to be used to activate your favorite trick. I am very curious about this wording. Just to just to say, I'm I don't understand why you could just use the your favorite trick once per short rest without expending a bardic inspiration die. Seems like a I'm I'm not a fan of abilities that require you to roll initiative with your resource fully expended because I feel like players generally, if they're out of bardic inspiration or if they're out of key points or something along those lines, they take a short rest. And yeah. Bardic Inspiration comes back on a short rest anyways. Eventually. Yeah, starting at fifth level. So when, so when you get once, this, Once yeah. you get this ability. So I feel like players very rarely like it when they roll initiative without like their key resource. The Battlemaster Fighter has this too. So, so this is essentially an ability that is only going to come up if you're unable to take a short rest and have to do multiple combat encounters and you've expended yeah. all of your Bardic Inspirations. Yeah. So yeah. that actually narrows it into a niche it is pretty niche, and it's uh, yeah. And so I I feel like I, I would have been a little more generous with. I, I question how often it would come up, right? And then you have to use that bardic inspiration for your favorite trick. So if your favorite trick isn't applicable to the combat that you're going into, then you're also. So with that, let's look at the tricks. So. I don't think we're going to have time in this episode to detail every single trick because these are actually quite wordy. But there is one here that is for each of the main classes in D&D, and they all sort of give you a little bit of the flavor of having an ability like that class. If you learn from a monk, you get to make unarmed strikes. If you learn from a druid, you can summon a, a spectral critter. If you learn from a warlock, you get an eldritch invocation. If you learn from a sorcerer, you get to blast things. It's, it's all very flavored around the subclass that you learn from and you're going to be learning multiple of these there's one issue however all of these features use your wisdom modifier instead of your charisma modifier so some of them they will have you make a die roll and add your wisdom modifier to it 
or some of them will, will base a DC on your wisdom modifier in some way. And so this makes it a little bit challenging because bards want to have a good charisma score. Several of these features are also based around making melee or ranged attacks, which means that you need to use your strength or dexterity for them. So that you want so this subclass is pulling you to have a good wisdom, a good charisma, and a good dexterity score in order to make the most out of all of these features and your spells at the same time. I'm having a hard time loving this subclass. I want to talk about what's cool here. I I I very much understand the theme. You're a traveling bard, and in your travels, you meet a lot of really interesting people, and you pick up little skills and tricks from them along the way, which is very humble and nice and humble woodsy. Um, the hard part for me is that you actually gain nothing above sixth level except for more tricks and more powerful tricks. The tricks are everything that's going on here. Your tricks use your bardic inspiration. So you have a limited resource that is used for other th bards like to use bardic inspiration they like for bardic inspiration yeah. yeah so your resource that is the main thing that you want to do with a bard is now also the only resource that fuels the main thing that this class has going for it and if you're not using your tricks you don't really have a subclass and these tricks use a bonus action they use your bardic inspiration um they're they give you a minor ability that you can use. Some of them are kind of cool. Yeah, in, in fairness, um, some of them are just very different. Like, for example, one of them actually is a reaction. It's the acrobatics lesson, which is letting you add um, your bardic inspiration die and your wisdom modifier to someone's dexterity saving throw, which is cool for saving somebody. Eventually it works like evasion. Yes, but then compare that to the armed combat lessons, which actually lets you spend a bardic inspiration die to gain a fighting style for 10 minutes. Or the boxing lessons, which let you make unarmed strikes by expending a bardic inspiration. Some of these also require you to concentrate on an effect goal. So the cleric ability gives out temporary hit points, but you have to concentrate to keep those temporary hit points in place. The The ranger feature lets you at, have extra damage on attacks, but you have to concentrate on it like Hex does. So some of these ones are, so we've got wisdom modifier involved, some involve concentration, some involve having to make attacks. We don't have the, there is the fighter feature lets you attack twice instead of once, once over the duration of while you have the fighting style, but we don't have any baked in features here that give us extra attack. So a lot of these are combat focused without extra attack. Some involve concentration. They're using a non-standard attribute. They're linked to wisdom instead of charisma. I already said that, yeah. but, but it, it just, I, I think this subclass is a C for me. Um, I like what's going on here in theory, but I actually, I, if it was me, I would have made it linked to charisma. And I would have given the combat focused tricks an extra attack feature. I think that some of these abilities would have worked better as just pure passives. It is cool being able to use your bardic inspiration in a different way. Yes. Right? Here's the design trick, I think, for me. I love seeing bardic sub subclasses say, here's a new way to use bardic inspiration. But I don't like when the entire subclass is based on using your bardic inspiration for for this for this other thing, saying yeah. you aren't going to get the chance to use it normally, because if you're not using it for this, you don't have anything else going on. Well, the thing that I was really looking for is what are the ones here that augment your spells, mm -hmm. and there is one. The wizard feature lets you change the damage type of your damage dealing spells by expending a bardic inspiration, so that's cool. And I do think that the warlock one that gives you an invocation or spells from the warlock spell list looks really good too. The interesting thing with the warlock is that in order to use that trick, you have to roll your bardic inspiration and take necrotic damage. You gain the invocation for 10 minutes, but it's it's a it's the weird one that stood out to me around yeah. like, oh cool, an invocation. And then it's like, but oh like, but... why am I but like yeah, and I feel like I feel like if the two tricks that you picked were the blaster wizard one and the warlock one, you've kind of got an interesting combo going on here. Um, because you can get a warlock invocation and then opening up the scope of like different warlock invocations is pretty cool. You could probably find something. You do have to meet the prerequisites. You, you do, which means that you can't take the one. It's still like taking the feat. 
Yeah. Right? So I, I think I'm still sticking with a C because yeah. there are a lot of feats that actually get me better versions of, like, the Warlock thing I know here there is a like... feat. Yes. And Humblewood is one of the, the older third-party yes. um, books. It actually came out before Tasha's. Right. Right? Um, and so it does exist within the context of that. But, yeah, I do think that, like, a lot of the features that I really like here are features that I would 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 not necessarily need on a bard or that I would rather have a different bard subclass and take some feats around yeah. it. So I, I agree with, with, with the C it feels a little, it feels a little too niche for me to really, which is funny because it's a very open-ended option, yeah. but it's niche. Yeah. It's one of those ones where like, had there been like one or two really, really powerful features in here, but, but, I, I don't think that any any one of them stuck out to me as like, yeah. oh, this is... Because that's often what happens, is that you get a class where where it's like, here's 12 different things, and you're like, meh, 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 what? And then you see the build. You, yeah. you find the build, and you go, oh, I can make a really cool build here, yeah. and then that makes... That bumps it up. Yeah. But here I read them all, and I was like, I don't even know what I would pick. Yeah. Like, none of them made me feel like... Oh man, that's awesome. Moving on to the cleric. We get the community domain and the knight domain. Very different sides of the spectrum. The community domain is all about like feasting and friends and and kind of gathering your, your party together and being like, hey guys, we got this. And the knight domain's for the night owls. Ha. Huh. Literally. Oh man, I get it. Um, <laughs> so let's start with the community domain. The community do domain, as I said, is all about you kind of being, it, it almost feels like motherly. Yeah. It's like you're the cook, you're the caregiver, you make sure everybody's good, and you bring together everybody in a community. Uh, so let's start with the uh, the expanded spell list. All right. So we got Bless and Goodberry. Great. Aid and Heroism. Cool. We got Beacon of Hope and Spirit Guardians. Neat. We got Banishment and Faithful Hound. Okay. And then finally, Mass Cure Wounds and Telepathic Bond. We get, per level, at least one good option. And then, yes. and then the first two options are both like, good. With most of my clerics, I'm going to want Bless, Aid, Spirit Guardians, and Banishment anyways. I don't mind getting Telepathic Bond. And the only kind of thing that makes me go, oh, good Barry, is that I'm not, is that if you're taking this domain, you're not the life domain, which means that you can't do the life domain cleric with the good Barry. Having made expanded spell lists, yeah. I know that you put spells on here that just fit the theme more than anything. Yeah. And good Barry is very thematic because you're yeah, the, you're the, good. you're the cook. It's good. Um, you also get the blessing of the hearth at first level. So you can conjure a small cooking pot. Uh, and bring that out whenever the party is doing a short rest. And that allows everybody to re-roll one of their hit dice when they're regaining hit points. And you're also proficient in cook's utensils. It's it's a pretty ribbon feature, but you get to now yeah. role play during the short rest. You're cooking the soup and you so throw your good berries in So instead of other clerics that get heavy armor proficiency, it's all about the You token. get a pot. Yeah, you get a pot. Channel Divinity at second level yeah. lets us conjure a magnificent feast. And what this basically does is it lets you conjure a number of food items equal to your wisdom modifier. And these food items basically act like healing potions that restore 2d4 plus your wisdom. Uh, f sorry, 2d4 plus your cleric level. Which is good. That's yeah. better than a normal potion. Yeah. And and they last eight hours. So they're, they're, they're potions that are going to go off. Yeah. Uh, which is, which is kind of cool. You get to create a bunch of them. But they're health potions that, as you level up, are going to still be be useful at all levels of play. Yes, and they also remove Frightened and Poisoned. Here's the interesting thing about this one, is Channel Divinity comes back on a short rest. So at the start of the day, you and it takes you 10 minutes to use this ability. So the food items last for 8 hours or until the end of a rest. Uh, so you can't, you can't, you can't create a bunch of these... And short rest to get your channel divinity back. Right. So because, they yeah. are for your current adventure until you rest next. They're they're from now until well, basically, this is you get to make a number of healing potions equal to your wisdom modifier to carry you to your next short rest. Not bad. Actually not bad. And they're and they're pretty decent healing potions at two D four plus your cleric level. Yeah. Right? So I, I think that's actually pretty decent. Now at level six, we gain another channel divinity power. 
This is tricky because we're not getting a passive feature. So we're now choosing which of these channel divinities we're going to use. Clerics eventually do get multiple uses of channel divinity between rests, though. So we could conceivably have both of these. What this one does is it lets you effectively bless concentration free all your allies. So they can add a d6 to an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw once per round. I think each. I, I think it's each. Yeah. Uh, every ally that you choose has to be within 30 feet of you when you bestow this on them. And they also have to be within, um, they have to be able to see one of their allies to get the benefit, which is a weird restriction. So you have to be like, you have to be looking out for one another. I don't understand that restriction. It's just flavor. You're, you're, you're given, I guess, because you're You gotta look out for each other. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. So once, okay, so in order to bestow the boon, creatures only need to be able to see you and they need to be within 30 feet. After that, you can move so that you create a string, I guess, of people. Yeah, I mean, you're always going to be close to many. Yeah, like so it's nobody's be... running behind yeah. direct cover, but... So this lasts a number of rounds equal to your wisdom modifier as opposed to lasting like a minute. So this feature is really close to the Peace Domain Cleric feature. Ish, yeah. Right, which is a D4. And what's going to actually happen with this one is the subclass gets Divine Strike, which is a standard cleric boilerplate. And then at 17th level, the D6 goes to 2D6. And then, then we're done. Then we're done. And and so you could stack this community watch with Bless. Also at 17th level, your feast gets better too. Yeah. So both of your channel divinities get better at 17th yeah. level. Both of the, so our big gun features for the subclass are both based on channel divinity. And so, okay. Once again, a small gripe with this class. I, I think the channel divinities are awesome. They are. They are um, good. They're really powerful. Our first level ribbon feature, you get a pot and you can cook, whatever. Yeah. It's actually not as good as many other cleric first level features. Spellus is decent. Spellus is really decent, but yeah. other than the channel divinities, we gain divine strike. We yeah. get two channel divinities and divine strike, and that's our whole thing. The 17th level feature just says your channel divinities are better, which I would hope so at 17th level. So that is it for the class. Channel divinity again is a resource that is very limited we have one use of it until later where we get two do you ever get three you get a second use of channel divinity at level six mm -hmm. and then a third use at level 18 and that's per short rest so so you can use channel divinity multiple times per day but it is contingent on you getting some short rest i do think by level six a cleric can reliably be putting out their channel divinity every combat encounter Okay, so that, that makes it okay, but you're riding a very fine line. If you have yes. three combat encounters at level six... You're you, probably going to have a short rest somewhere in there. Hopefully. Hopefully. I've, I've played in games where we've gone a while without a short rest. It's, it's, it's true, and, and it's interesting that one of these channel divinity features goes away on it. Like, you want to use it between rests because of the restriction that the, the food expires on a rest. So right after your long rest, you want to cook up a bunch of health potions. But that's going to be one of, like, imagine you're a level six cleric with the subclass, right? You have two channel divinity uses. You spend one outside of combat to make the potions and distribute them to your party. And then on and one then, of your combat. Then if you're going to have to do, like, the, generally speaking, the way that I think about it is that characters have to do at least two combat encounters before they get a short rest. And so you are, no matter what, with this subclass going through one combat encounter where you have no subclass features. Well, your party has the potions that you made. Unless, no, because if you took a short rest, then your features came back. Yeah. Okay. But it does, like, it, it you, your power, like, it is just this activated ability and your spell list. I think that this is better than the bard that we looked at. I just, I feel like it could use one more ability. I agree. I mean, the blessing is pretty strong. I and, agree. And I, the, being able to make those healing potions is potentially a lot of healing. Like it scales up really, really fast because if you, because if you as a cleric get to a plus five wisdom modifier by level eight, then this channel divinity power, like if you're a 10th level cleric with a plus five wisdom modifier, you're getting 10d4 plus 
50 points of healing, which is a lot, but nothing compared to what a life domain cleric does with aura vitality. I think this subclass is a B for me. I think that I think that it's useful and it's thematic. Uh the night the the wa the like watch channel it, divinity is is actually great. It's just tricky because it like it feels like a weird combination of the life domain and the peace domain. Yeah. It's but it's not as good as either. Yeah. The life domain is a way better healer. And, and the, the peace, peace domain, domain has like the peace domain's buff is way better. It's yeah. not bad by any stretch. No. But yeah, I think it's like a B. I th I think it's a I B. think you I think you I think you could enjoy it but like if you're considering it it's like are you going to do like I feel like you it's, you bring more by specializing. It's actually hard because I'm giving it a B because I think it's it's good enough but it doesn't actually really fit into my I don't know the right campaign for this character. No, and and that's why why it's a it, but it's also not niche. Like none no. of its none of the features are bad. So so and none of the features are niche. Like they're broadly useful. Yes. Right? They're just it's it it, it th this is literally getting a B ranking because it doesn't feel like it's good enough to be an A, but it's also not so bad and so niche and so restrictive as to be any worse than a B. I agree. Yeah. So it it has to get B, even yeah. though I don't really know the campaign that this belongs in. You know what it is? It's a Humblewood campaign. That's yeah. where it belongs. There you go. There you go. So the night domain. So the dark, the dark side yeah. of our we're, we're, of our Humblewood yeah. clerics. Things are getting dark in Humblewood. Uh. <laughs> so this one's all about what do the furry animals get up to after dark i mean furry animals are notorious for being nocturnal so when i think of all, almost all the humble humblewood creatures are nocturnal creatures honestly and like the forest is a scary place at night and like you do not know what kind of screaming is coming and what kind of animal that screeching and screaming is coming from you know when i'm alone or like when i'm when i'm in my house and it's like nighttime outside the animals kind of get free run of what's going on out there yeah like it's it's nighttime when i open up my back window and i'm like oh there's the deer and the raccoons and the rabbits and they're all in my backyard and I, I live near a park, so uh, I actually do get that. Yeah. But it's like once we've gone inside and the and the sun goes down, the animals are just like, it's my time. Yeah. So let's talk about the night domain cleric, which actually feels really suiting Honestly, for the nocturnal play a animals. I would obviously play a raccoon. A ra a ra <laughs> you may not know this. Here in Toronto, we have lots of raccoons, and I love them. They are adorable. <laughs> they eat my trash. They're little conniving monsters, and I just love them. Okay, so spell list. We got sleep and a new spell called Veal of Dusk, which gives advantage on stealth checks. We got darkness and moonbeam. We got non-detection and globe of twilight, which is kind of, again, like a sphere of darkness that it creates. We got divination and stellar bodies, which is actually co conjuring comets that you can fire out at people. And we got dream and seeming. Thematic. Spell Very, very thematic. Um, and we're going to actually have a feature that buffs up sleep. Um, I love moonbeam on a cleric. Yeah. We also got darkness, which is going to be pretty useful here. Because at first level, we gain Eye of Twilight. This essentially gives you dark vision that can see in magical darkness. And as you level up, it gets long. The, the, area the range gets, gets yeah. further. Your ability to see in magical darkness gets further. And eventually, at the highest levels, you just gain true sight. So already at first level, we've given this cleric. I mean, they don't have darkness yet, but we've equipped them in the manner that they get to do the cast darkness on yourself and blast creatures with advantage from within your darkness because you can see. So we're already a cleric that's getting one of the most broken combat shticks in D&D 5e. Yeah. Also at first level, we're going to get Ward of Shadows. Basically, when you're attacked, you can impose disadvantage on that attack roll. It's a number of times equal to your wisdom modifier. This is actually basically the same feature as the warding flare of the light domain. So I think that they're kind of playing with like the the opposites. You ward and, with shadows, and it's gonna, ward with fire. And it's going to actually get the sixth level feature that the light domain gets of upgrading as well to use it as a reaction on allies as well. Um, what's interesting about this feature is that because though it imposes disadvantage 
And there's so many features that this class gets that cause blindness or darkness. Your enemies could, are going to be attacking with disadvantage a lot already. This is... This cleric is a disadvantage dealing. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. At second level, we gain our channel divinity, which is invocation of night. You basically blast out darkness and all hostile creatures within 30 feet of you have to make a constitution saving throw or they're blinded. Um, so that's pretty good. Uh, AOE blindness is is pretty a pretty powerful debuff. As a non-concentration short rest ability, yeah. They get to repeat the saving throw. They they do. The, those that do fail the initial save do get to make a saving throw at the end of each of their turns to end the effect. But that's still pretty impactful. I mean, even one round of all of the creatures being blinded, they have disadvantage on all their attacks and you have yeah. advantage on attacks against them. It's it's blinded is one of the best conditions to throw on an enemy. So as we said, at level six, you get the improved ward. You can use it on allies now. And at level eight, you get Veal of Dreams. So this subclass is actually breaking the tradition of the cleric subclasses, either giving you the bonus Divine Strike or the potent Cantrip feature. And it's giving you a full-blown extra feature at level eight, which really makes the other <laughs> subclass in this book feel very imbalanced. Yeah, by our, our other cleric feels like it's missing a feature, and this cleric gets yeah. extra features. Uh, and this one is a boost that you add your cleric level to the number of uh, hit points of monsters you affect when you cast sleep. And you can choose the order in which creatures are affected by sleep. And if that wasn't enough, a creature that you put to sleep cannot be woken until the start of your next turn. So if you upcast sleep and cast this on somebody and put them to sleep, your entire party can just start critting them with, with attacks because they're unconscious and they won't wake up. Although that that does, they do have to kind of be within that threshold. Yeah. Right? But with you adding your cleric level, this just means that as like, even at this level, eight plus an upcasted sleep is pretty decent. Yeah. like. Uh, it's a good finisher, right? Yeah. Because it it what it does is sleep is by default five d eight hit points, so it basically means that you're you're getting now whatever the average from that was of of five d eight, which is about twenty two hit points on average. So that's bringing it to thirty. So your first level spell is now kind of doing thirty damage against a creature that is. At under 30 hit points. So you could use it effectively, although 8th level also is the point where sleep really has really been dropped off for a while. Yeah. So it's... Uh. This is making sleep a useful spell at this level, but no, I, I'd say it, it's, it's just allowing it to... It's hard to use. Yeah. 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 And finally, at 17th level, we gain Creature of the Night, which essentially lets us blast out darkness, turn off all the lights in the area, shut down everything, making it heavily obscured. And of course, we can we can see in that, so we're all good. Enemies in the shadows are frightened and blinded. Yeah. Uh, and nothing short of a ninth level spell can get rid of the darkness. Does this affect, does the darkness affect your allies though? Only enemies in the shadows are blinded and frightened. But your allies do have to deal with the fact that they're in heavily obscured yeah. darkness. Yeah. So you're turning off the lights for everybody, but the enemies are frightened and blinded. So I don't quite know where the advantage disadvantage works out there. If your friends can Seventeenth level, everyone could have blind sight or the warlock invocation. You would hope so. Yeah. Still, this subclass does a whole lot of dishing out disadvantage. Yeah, I like it. I think it's an A. I think it's an A. Yeah, I think it's. I I, I think that the channel divinity alone. So th this is such the contrasting example, right? Because the channel divinity power, there's only one of them, and it's really obvious how you use it, right? Yeah. Like honestly, with this cleric, all you kind of have to do is get your spirit guardians out, get your spiritual weapon rolling buff up your allies, and then just walk into the middle of all your enemies and blind them. And blindness is such a great debuff because enemies that are blinded have disadvantage on attack rolls, but your allies gain advantage on attacks against the blinded enemies. Yeah. So you're giving advantage to your whole party while also protecting... Like, it's blindness is the, this 
perfect mix of offense and defense. Absolutely. And yeah. so I think dishing out blindness, if you're not dishing out blindness, you're cast if you're not casting spirit guardians, you're casting darkness on yourself and like shooting guiding bolts out of your darkness. Yeah. Or uh, toll the dead. Or toll the dead. Yeah. I uh, told the dead's a saving throw though, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Well, either way. Um there's a lot to play with here in the fact that you're debuffing characters monsters can't hit you as easily. Mm. You can see in magical darkness. You can create magical darkness. Yeah, I think I think it's an yeah. A. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. Next up we have the fighter, which is called I, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, the Scofflaw. Um, th from reading over this fighter, they're a dirty fighter. They're like a bar fighter. They're the smashing tables and chairs over your head, empty bottles smashing. Over. They're, they're the yeah. old school Western bar fight scene in a fighter. They, they, it describes it as the fighter that balks at the ideals of honor and tradition. So that would be scoffing at the law. So scoff law. law. That's my guess. Yeah, scofflaw. It's it sounds like kind of like a bird, like scofflaw. Like ah, I don't know. So first, the scofflaw is going to get a roguish skill, or they can learn thieves can't. So you can either get something like sleight of hand, or stealth, or deception, insight, intimidation, um, added to your skill proficiencies, which. You know, fighters always like having an extra skill. It helps you out. I think it's, I kind of wish that they just gave you Thieves Cant because honestly, Thieves Cant has come up once in all of my campaigns. Yeah. Could have just, could have just handed that one out. You also get intimidating banter. So when you're making charisma checks in combat, they use your dexterity or strength score instead of your, your charisma, which I like. I, I like that because I always yeah. thought that intimidation is ne is rarely about words. Intimidation to me is more about presence. In in combat, certainly. I think that there is a certain measure where intimidation is about the the seven foot tall muscle guy doesn't need to say a word for me to feel intimidated by him. Mm. The guy who can twirl a knife in his hands intimidates me. So so using strength and dexterity for intimidation is something that I always thought. My opinion on that, and this is just me aside, is there's a difference between being scared of somebody and being intimidated by someone. And uh, intimidation in D&D is more like browbeating in that you are using the threat of physical violence to convince someone to do something that they wouldn't. Whereas a physically imposing person might just be scary and you just want to run. So would you say that Riddick is charismatic. There's that scene in Chronicles of Riddick mm. where he kills a guy with a cup. And then the other two, he, he starts that scene with being like, I'm going to kill you with this teacup. And then he does. And then he puts a pen on the table next to him. I mean, Vin Diesel is a very charming man. I mean, okay, fair enough. Uh, um, <laughs> but, you know, without opening that, that whole debate, um, it's still kind of cool to be able to do this in combat. Yeah. The, yeah. the moral of what yeah. I'm trying to say is that I like that it's here because I always yeah. like using other skills for intimidation. Yes. Also, at their level, we gain Brutal Brawler. This is going to allow us to use improvised weapons a lot better. All improv weapons now have the finesse property and we are proficient with them. And we gain an additional option to use a bonus action to break our weapon over a character to do additional 2d6 damage. Uh, no, it deal max damage to the target. Right, max damage to the target. At later levels, it adds an additional 2d6 to the breaking damage on top of the max damage. So this is the grabbing a chair and smashing yeah. somebody with and it. And at 18th level, you just have advantage on all attacks you make with improvised weapons. So this just gets better and better. Eventually, yeah. you're making improvised smashing attacks with advantage, doing additional damage plus max damage. It's I like features that scale. Yeah, and I, yeah. Like, I like picking up things in a bar and beating people to death with Yeah. Here comes the rock with his steel chair. So this is Riddick with his teacup. <laughs> yeah. 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 You could be that. You could do that scene where he places the teacup down and the guy's like, you're going to kill me with what? Your bare hands? No, I'm going to kill you with this teacup. <laughs> like. <laughs> what a dark, what a dark subclass to be in the Humblewood book. <laughs> I know. Picture your cute little critters murdering people with Oh chairs. my god, it's like the Woodland Friends are having tea, and they just look at you being like, you think we're unarmed. We're not. You think we're cute furry animals, and we are. 
<laughs> Today's the day the teddy bears have their picnic. <laughs> What's for lunch, you? It gets funnier the more I think about it. Like this is such, this is such a messy and violent subclass <laughs> for Humblewood. No, there ain't nothing humble going on. No, no, no. I, that's not a complaint. No, not a complaint. <laughs> it's it's fantastic, but like, yeah, it's not a flaw. It's a feature. Yeah, like if you thought that this was a cute, cutesy campaign setting, uh... you're smashing a beer bottle and stabbing somebody with it. <laughs> it's yeah. just a squirrel. <laughs> oh the squirrels are violent this time of year uh, i i mean and squirrels are masters of improvised weapons i mean i saw a red squirrel drop kick another squirrel out of my tree when i was sitting in my backyard chilling last summer so yeah i yeah. see it nature is a violent place it is it really is <laughs> the other the other day i heard uh we have co coyotes in the park near my house I heard them making a whole lot of noise, which usually means they got something. They're just yapping. I didn't want to think about it. I didn't want to yeah. think about what they got, yeah. but nature's cruel. Um, so we also got at seventh level, the misdirection feature, which we can ta taunt or fake out someone that's within five feet of us. Costs us a bonus action and they do get a saving throw against this. But if they fail, you force them to use your reaction, their reaction to attack somebody else within five feet of them. And if nobody else is within five feet of them, they attack the air where they thought you were. They're either hurting an ally or wasting their reaction, which also means that if they've wasted their reaction, you don't need to disengage to move away from them. Not bad. So you can misdirect, and if they fail yeah. and hit nobody, you can just get out of there. I mean, it's... it's... I would rather have the attack hit so that I get the damage from it. Yeah. But the, but that's still pretty good. So at 10th level, we gain blindside. The simple way of putting this is it's a once per short rest sneak attack thing, but it has some yeah. restrictions. You get a bunch of extra damage, but it either needs to be a target that you've misdirected. It needs to be a target that you have advantage on or a target that has not yet taken a turn in combat. This starts at 5d6 additional damage, but it also levels up as you gain higher levels. Uh, yeah, and it also has one of those things that at 18th level, if you've used up all your uses of it and had none, it comes back at the start of combat. So you get one per combat, yeah. basically. At 18th level. At 18th level. Yeah, yeah, effectively. Starting at 15th level, you can just force anybody you attack to make a saving throw or become frightened of you. And if they've heard of your infamy, they make the saving throw with disadvantage. They get to make subsequent saves to end the frightened effect. Yeah. But yeah, all you have to do is attack somebody to frighten them. Uh, yeah. This is this is a great subclass. Yeah. I mean, we're not even done yet. Yeah. Because at 18th level, you get two for flinching. When you take the attack action on a creature that you have misdirected, you can immediately make another attack against them. So that's on top. We're We're a fighter. So, and we're an 18th level fighter. So we have So this four. is like, this is like five attack. Yeah. You're making five attacks yeah. against a target that had to waste its reaction attacking an ally. Yeah. Um, this is really good. And also like murder raccoon. Well, so literally the book has a picture of the cutest. I mean, he looks mischievous as heck, but he's still the cutest raccoon ever because the anthropomorphic characters in this book have big heads. Yeah. So they look like little chibi Yes. So, like, your little chibi raccoon is smashing bottles, stabbing Honestly, people, Honestly, do you murdering. want to get into it with a Toronto raccoon? No. No. I really want one as a pet, but they always look like they're going to murder me. So. Yeah. Murder raccoon. This is murder raccoon, or squirrel, or owl, or whatever you want it to be. But yeah. this is a great fighter subclass. I think it's easily an... It I don't know if it's S tier, but it could be. Like, it's it's got a lot going for it. Yeah. It's either an A plus or an X. Yeah. I, I'm going to I'm gonna be cautious and give it an A plus. Like, it doesn't quite have the flexibility of an Eldritch Knight or a Battlemaster. If, if everybody out there says you're wrong, it's S, I, I, I'm probably willing to bend to that. Yeah. Um, it just feels like it gets a lot of extra da damage. You're intimidating. You're frightening. You're dealing a bunch of extra damage. You're misdirecting. You're wasting reactions. You're, you're, I don't know, stabbing people with every object around you. I mean, it, it remains to be seen whether the improvised weapons are actually worth doing. What's interesting is the implication here is that any improvised weapon could be broken 
over a creature. Yeah, but so if I'm grabbing rocks out in the wilderness and just smashing them on a character's head over and over again, like, but breaking the improvised weapon is a bonus action, and I, I, I feel like once I get the misdirection feature, I would generally rather misdirect if I can. I would say if the, if you're fighting a target that doesn't have another target next to it, that's true. Then I would break that's my true. improvised weapon. It's a really weapon. interesting option to be able to do one or the other. Like, I like that misdirect is less interesting when I'm just making them waste their reaction for nothing. I'd rather get the max damage. But like the notion of misdirecting a giant into attacking another giant. Right. Yeah. Like you could misdirect a pretty big enemy that has a much beefier hit than you do. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's good. It's, it's definitely an A plus. And I, I think that like just frightening anybody that you attack is, is also just really good. That infamy feature makes, makes me almost want to do ranged weapons and improvised weapons. Like it's, it's weird because like the frightened thing is interesting because like one of the cool things about frightening targets is that they can't move any closer to you. Yeah. It's a really good debuff when you get to, to land it. So I don't know. I, I really like this. And, and yeah, the Toronto murder raccoon. I mean, all I'm saying right now, I know that Jill has Humblewood and has been talking about it for a few years. And she mentioned that she would run Humblewood if she was to run something. That's one of her Can ideas. Can we do Humblewood, but it's set in High Park in Toronto? Yes. I mean, we have to sell Jill on that. But if Jill runs Humblewood, yeah. I'm playing this or the Don subclass. Va- be like the animals of the Don Valley versus the animals of High Park. Oh, my God. Like, a- a- woodland or... High Park creatures. is goose and squirrels. Yeah. Geese, not goose. There's not a singular goose. There's many geese. Uh, yeah, High Park is full of raccoon geese and squirrels. And raccoons. Uh, I'm raccoons pl- run the streets. I'm and... playing a raccoon fighter. Yeah. That is what I want to do. Although I could see grabbing this uh, this subclass and throwing yeah. it into your non-raccoon-centric game. Squirrel wizards. Squirrel. Because yeah. it's a quarrel. Yeah. It's a squirrel. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Um, Anyways, this this was a look at the Humblewood subclasses. Surprisingly dark and violent. Yeah. Yeah. Like the animals that you think are cute and cuddly. They're surprisingly dark yeah. and violent. I mean, Redwall had some undertones. I mean, all of those yeah. types of stories have like You know another dark an- like story it's less fantasy than anything else. Watership Down. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. There's also like I th- for some reason what always pops into my head is like the underrated cousin to all of these is the secret of nim yeah yeah which yeah. i really want to watch that again but yeah there's a lot of fantasy out there that involves animals at war and it's usually pretty dark and much more yeah. adult than you think when, it is. yeah yeah so it, it, and it's the type of thing that grabs you in your childhood and stays with you for life. yeah you watch these <laughs> as kids and then you go back and you're like man they were making some deep things about like yeah. political and your parents didn't even know because it was just fuzzy animals yeah they're like here watch these fuzzy animals with sword because you like heroics <laughs> and it's oh, like you're being emotionally war dark. crimes and murder and yeah. death and <laughs> a raccoon smashing a chair over your head yeah um so tell us your thoughts on the humblewood subclasses in the comments below the videos that we make on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity of our Patreon supporters. If you enjoyed the work that we do here on YouTube, please consider either joining our Patreon or we got a Kickstarter coming out for Monsters of Drakenheim. Check that out. Below. Links are all down below. And if you want to see us playing some D&D 5e, you can check out our actual Play in the Worlds of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday evenings here on YouTube. But you can check all the previous episodes out right up over here. And we got plenty more tier ranking. We did all the Grim Hollow content. We're going to be looking at a lot more subclasses by third-party creators. Check that all out up over here. Please subscribe to our channel, like this video, and ring that bell so that you never miss an episode. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time in the, the dungeon. dungeon.